We're going to get into God's Word today. Are you ready for that? Amen. We are continuing our series, Ruth. A story of redemption, this wonderful, beautiful, little narrative story uh, that's told in the Old Testament. It's not only a personal story of redemption, but it fits within the larger scheme of God's salvation story. And we're going to get into that probably even more next week when our sister Suzanne is going to finish up the series. So she'll be preaching the last part next week. Uh, But the anchor verse for our series is verse 16 of chapter 1, where Ruth says to her mother-in-law, Naomi, me, where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. The story of Ruth teaches us about radical devotion and radical inclusion in the family of God. And one important feature that we have to take into consideration about Ruth is that we see God working really kind of behind the scenes, in the ordinary realities of life, and might I even say the ordinary messiness of life. The narrator attributes things to God that the characters within the story don't see immediately or recognize. And I think that's so true of how God is at work in our lives. With that in mind, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word, which comes to us from the third chapter of Ruth. Hear these words of God for us today. One day, Ruth's mother-in-law, Naomi, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you, where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and everything her mother-in-law and did, did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. And then verse 18, Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. This is the word of God for the people of God. And we say together, thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks for this holy day and for this holy space set apart for us. We give you thanks for the words that you have put upon our lips to sing, to declare, and to pray. And now as we come to this time in your holy word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would so work in our hearts that from our time together, we might become more and more your holy people. In Christ's name, amen. Author Bill Booknight tells the story of events that happened on an isolated Pacific island where it was the custom for a young man who was interested in marrying a young woman to announce his intention to the village and then go to her father and there offer a bride price. And they would barter and there would be an agreement and that would allow them to be married. The main item of value on this particular island was a cow. Cows held value, and so oftentimes a young man would offer a certain number of cows, and then there would be a counteroffer. The highest number of cows ever offered on this particular island was four cows. The most eligible bachelor in the story is a man named Johnny, who was the most eligible bachelor. He was handsome and wealthy, and he announced that he had decided that he wanted to marry a young lady, to which all the villagers wondered which one it would be. To their surprise, he chose a young girl named Lisa, who was not at all in the top ten. She was frightfully shy and rather plain in appearance. And some of the jokers in the crowd suggested that maybe the father would offer Johnny some cows to take her off his hands. The community gathered around Lisa's house, and they were flabbergasted, startled, surprised when Johnny opened the bid with eight cows. The father was almost fainting, and immediately shook his hand in pledge, and there the bride price was paid. That very evening, Johnny and Lisa were married, and they departed to live in a different place. 
A year later, they returned to the village, and the whole townspeople were amazed, not because of Johnny and Lisa together, but because of how Lisa looked. She was colorful in appearance and confident in how she walked. She had been transformed. And they all celebrated their return until people pulled Johnny to the side and say, what happened? <laughs> how do you explain this transformation? What did you do? And Johnny said, I tell you that from the time Lisa was born, she had been treated as though she was not worth very much. And she had begun to believe that about herself. I announced to the community that she was an eight cow wife and I have treated her just that way. She has become the vision of herself that she sees every day in my eyes. Buck Knight goes on to say, if you want an eight cow wife or husband, you have to catch that vision first and then treat him or her that way. God, the master change agent, may produce the eight cow wife or husband that you envision. Now, just as Johnny saw value in Lisa, which brought her out of her shell and brought the reality of who she really was out for everyone to see, so the author of Ruth is painting a picture for us of what treating people with value can actually do and all the ramifications of it. Ruth is repeatedly referred to in the narrative as Ruth the Moabite. The narrator wants us to know her ethnic identity. And this is underscoring the truth in light of the animosity that existed between the Jewish people and the Moabite people. And the narrator is showing Ruth as a confident woman who is courageous, who ends up being part of the wonderful salvation story that God is writing for all people. And yet, this Ruth the Moabite is recorded as being a woman of noble character. She is heroic in how she lives. She attaches herself to Naomi, and she chooses more insecurity for her life in the name of devotion than she, she, she could have. Uh, this is a particular thing that God does throughout Scripture. Jesus actually used a similar approach in storytelling when he told the story of the Good Samaritan where the Samaritan man is the person of good character who comes to the aid of a Jewish person even though the Jews despise Samaritans and that was Jesus' audience. It seems God is constantly challenging his people regarding the human condition in each of us that values some and despises others for various reasons that are not really good. The message of value and inclusion is found in how Naomi and Boaz address Ruth in chapter 3. Both of them refer to Ruth as my daughter. What a beautiful language that is from a Jewish perspective to treat a Moabite in terms of family, daughter. That's a familial term. That's a sense of social obligation uh, that you, you see uh, in there. Um, and it counters the narrative of exclusion that in many ways was coded into the Jewish people. Remember, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, that coded within the law of Moses was an exclusion of Moabites and Ammonites from being in the temple. But that's not the heart of God. You know, oftentimes things are written because of the hardness of people's hearts. But God's heart is revealed and manifest in the story of Ruth and how God wants us to treat others. As we reach this part of the story of Ruth, we find an unconventional marriage proposal that, that radically de declares extraordinary value in the face of a culture that had inappropriate values. This is what we're going to see at play in this part, in this chapter 3. Um, it's important for us to remember that this story takes place during the time of the judges. And it was in this time where everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Everybody just wrote their own standards Everybody had disregard for God's rule by the laws that God had already established for the people. People were just doing what they wanted to do. Yet in this story, there's something beautiful that comes to play. There's a couple of people who transcend the selfishness and the self-indulgence of culture. And they come together extraordinarily to display humanity as God intends for humanity to be. It's an unlikely pairing of a, of a wealthy older man with a young female immigrant. 
Years ago, one of my relatives gave a book to me for Christmas, and uh, people give me books a lot, and when you give me a book, I feel obligated to read it, and I don't read all the books because I don't have time to read all the books. But I was compelled to read this book, Same Kind of Different as Me. Anybody ever read Same Kind of Different as Me? Oh, you got to read Same Kind of Different as Me. You start reading that book, and all of a sudden, you start asking questions early on. Uh, the first question that you're going to ask early on in Same Kind of Different as Me is how in the world did these two people ever come together to write a book like this? Two very different people. A very uh, high, white, wealthy art dealer from Fort Worth, Texas and a black homeless man from Mississippi. And they write in their vernacular and they write from their perspectives and over the course as the chapters unfold, you start asking some radical questions such as how did these two ever come together? Right, And eventually you find out, and I'm not going to spoil it for you. There's a movie out about it, but there's also a book. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to read it. But here we see the pairing of Boaz and Ruth, or Ruth and Boaz, however you want to talk about that. And you start thinking, how did they ever come together? Because in their coming together is part of the lineage of Jesus. And that's why it's important. That's why it's recorded in Scripture. But it's also recorded in Scripture because not only is it a transactional lineage of Jesus, but there's something within the message itself that speaks to us as followers of Jesus. And so the first thing that we see in this text is that they are driven together by the need for security. Listen to what Naomi says. In, in verse 1 of our text, it says that Naomi says to her, my daughter, there's that word again, daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. So Naomi is a a mother-in-law, and uh, she has a desire for her daughter-in-law to find a home. Now, the literal Hebrew meaning is rest, which kind of gives the idea of uh, of a sense of security, that what Naomi wants for her daughter-in-law, whom she's treating just as her daughter, is her best interest, security. And they had seen the hand of God's provision up till this time in the story, about six weeks, where they were enjoying the benefits of harvest. And during the season of harvest, as Dustin brought out last week, there was uh, the the law of harvest, which said that you should leave the corners of the field unharvested to let the poor glean from them. And don't go over your field a second time to catch what you missed. Leave it for the poor. And so here's Ruth and a bunch of other people who were harvesting because they were in poverty and they were getting hand-to-mouth subsistence. They were getting their needs met. And it, but it was temporary because harvest doesn't last all year long. Harvest lasts for a season. And then what happens? And so Naomi is concerned about the longer-term picture, security. And uh, they had benefited from this temporary situation, and now they need a permanent situation. That's what the concern is for Naomi. Security is the state of being free from danger or threat. Just the whole idea of security is a driving force. Uh, it's, It's something that we all long for. We all long for security. We all want something that we can feel is permanent, something that is established, something that's not going to change radically from day to day or, or week to week. And, uh, and, and what Naomi knew is that Ruth needed to find a secure place to live where all her needs would be met, and that involved finding a husband. I think in this way we see Naomi really functioning as the parent in the story. Uh, Maybe this would be something that a father would probably want to do for his daughter, but the father is no more. He's dead. So here's Naomi, and she is is playing this role uh, to launch her daughter. (laughs) And this captures the heart, I think, of what loving parenting is about, which is launching. You know, we want, I'm a parent of three adult kids, and we want our kids to be fully launched, right, where where they are, they're, they're seeing their needs met by a, according to uh, a level of independence from, from us. But I think it also illustrates the heart of God and what God longs for us as people to find true security, to find a place of rest. And perhaps this is no better illustrated than in the words of Jesus in Matthew 11, where Jesus stands up and he says, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am 
gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That wonderful invitation of Jesus to anyone and everyone, come to me and you're going to find what you're looking for, which is rest. You're going to find a sense of security, that you're going to find an end to your striving out of insecurity, and you're going to find relief, you're going to find hope, you're going to find direction because you yoke yourself to me. You're going to find me as your good shepherd. You're going to find me as the one who can guide you the best, and I will never lead you astray. So you can see Jesus offering this. So this idea here is that God longs to meet our needs for security, and when we don't trust God to meet our needs for security, we get yoked to some terrible things. We get yoked to the wrong person. We get yoked to the wrong job. We get yoked to the wrong relationships. We get yoked to the wrong things in life. If we cannot trust God to lead us, to yoke us, and God wants to yoke us, and we need to be yoked. We need to have community. We need security, and we need to find that security through community. And the ministry of Jesus is constantly calling us from our places of insecurity and uncertainty into something that's life-giving a relationship that meets our needs and transforms our daily activities into something that is joy-filled uh, in an overflow. And this is what Naomi wants for Ruth. It's always been what she's always wanted. We can see it early on in the stories. We talked about it in week one, in Ruth one, where it says Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, go back each of you to your own, to your mother's home. May, may the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. And so Naomi is carrying this burden for Ruth, and she wants it for her to put her in the best possible position for long-term fruitfulness. And she's wrestling with her own uncertainties about life, and yet she knows that she's putting Ruth first in this regard. Um, Naomi is carrying the burden of getting Ruth in the right position. This is the burden of so many parents and guardians and so many people who have children or people. We just want them to choose what's best. We want them to get to places of rest and security. We want to position people for thriving. Good people want that. And so Naomi, Naomi is, a good, is a good woman in wanting this. And then listen to what she says in verse 2 at the beginning where, where she says this. She says, now, Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. And Naomi sees that the best possibility for Ruth would be to be yoked to Boaz. This, this idea of being a relative creates social obligation. Social obligation is a beautiful thing. Or a sense where we feel, because of our relationship connection, we have an obligation to help and to cover and to care for and, uh, and we've seen Naomi move in our story. Remember, we made the case at the beginning that while this book is, has the title of Ruth, really Naomi is the really focal point of getting her to a place of, uh, of security and, 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 and help and relief. And we've seen her move from a place of bitterness at the end of chapter 1 where she's blaming God. She says, I've returned empty. Uh, the Lord has made me bitter. Uh, and she's attributing all these negative things in her life to God because God did not keep it from happening. But now we see her moving from a place of bitterness to a place of hope where, wow, Boaz, you've ran into Boaz. And Boaz is important because he has the potential to make life different and better for us. And so her movements is from bitterness to hope, and yet we're going to discover still the need, as we all have, to wrestle with what it means to trust God for the needs in our life, which leads us to a second thing, that one of the movements that gets Ruth and Boaz together is not only the need for security, but a misguided strategy that is put into play, and we see it at the end of verse 2 on. Listen to what Naomi says to Ruth. Tonight, you will be winnowing barley at the, heart, at the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor. But don't let him know you're there until he has finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go down. And then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. 
Naomi's intentions, I think, are good, right? She wants security for her daughter, but they're colored by her own attempt to try to make something happen. Her instructions go well beyond anything appropriate that any parent would want to tell their daughter to do. You know, if it was just, hey, you know, put your best face forward, right? Take a bath, get your hair done, dress in something nice, that would be one thing. That'd be good counsel. You know, you don't want to be wearing the worst of you around. But, but there's something else at play. Consider with me the context in which the narrator wants us to know this advice is being given. He's going to be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Now, this was a particular moment in the harvest season where a few things were at play. One, the harvest had fully come in, so there was no more harvesting out in the fields. It was all collected, and it was collected at the threshing floor. And in the threshing floor was the opportunity for, to, to use the animals to, to, to take away the chaff, and we talked about that, where the separation of the wheat from the chaff, and then you would pull all that into the center there, and there would be a bunch of men who would be guarding that until it could be stored properly and distributed well. And it was a high season of potential bandits coming in to steal. So you'd have all the men there, and their, one of their main tasks was to guard the harvest from people who might steal it. But in that, there was also an abundance, and so you would have a whole lot of drinking going on and celebrating. And the only women that would ever come to a threshing floor would be women of bad reputation who were there to be used by the men for their pleasure. That's the only women that would be at the threshing floor. And so Naomi tells her daughter-in-law to go, go at night, go during this time, wait until he's finished eating and drinking, which means let him get carried away in his celebration, get a little tipsy, throw off his judgment a little bit, and then uncover his feet and just lay down there, and he'll know what to do. This does not sound like good advice, <laughs> right? I mean, I've read some scholars who try to justify this and try to metaphorize and all that. It just doesn't work. And which tells us that there's a whole lot of people who have great intentions but have some misguided advice. <laughs> Terrible strategies. And we see that at play in this story. It's very risky sending a young woman dressed to attract a man in the dark to a place where the only women would be people of bad reputation. And the one thing that Naomi does not do is pray about that. <laughs> right? God's not in her language. In fact, the only language of God in Naomi through the story is one of complaint about how God has made it hard for her. We're not going to get on Naomi. She's a good woman. Except sometimes good people have bad advice. And part of that is because we haven't learned to trust God. Um, in fact, Naomi finds herself in a long line of people. Sarai, the, the wife of Abram, was the one who had the great strategy for Abram to sleep with Hagar to bear them a child. Or Rachel, who instructed Jacob in how to deceive his father to steal a blessing. And uh, we don't want to get into all the men who've had bad advice, otherwise we'd be here all day. <laughs> And the whole point is, is that good people sometimes give bad advice, and what we need to learn how to do is trust God. We all have the human tendency to meddle in things when we shouldn't, trying to make God's will happen, and it always backfires. Except here, it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't is because we see a trustworthy redeemer who comes in and steps in the middle of the messiness and does something beautiful. And we see that at play in verse 8 and 9. It says, in the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a guardian redeemer of our family. Ruth follows Naomi's instructions, but it didn't go as Naomi probably thought it would go. Boaz is startled. Ruth goes off script. And she says, spread the corner of your garment over me. It's a metaphorical picture. Essentially, it is a proposal. Would you marry me? Would you take me in to be yours? This is what Ruth is saying in the moment. 
because you're a guardian redeemer. A guardian redeemer was a legal term within the culture of the day which created social obligation upon a male and a family to take up the cause of somebody, a relative, who couldn't help themselves, usually a woman who was maybe a widow or in trouble of some sort. The guardian redeemer would purchase land and uh, because a woman couldn't hold property in her name, but he would purchase the land, and sometimes, in many cases, he would marry the woman, therefore covering her, giving her his name, and therefore all her needs would be met. It was a, a way in which God had worked it out for people to take social obligation for each other, to, to take up the cause of the people around you and not just let every man be for himself. Um, and uh, so, so we see Ruth, and she makes a radical proposal. Where does she get this boldness from? Well, I think she gets the boldness from Boaz himself. Because in chapter 2, Boaz had greeted her when he met her. Listen to what he says uh, in verse uh, 11 and 12. It says, Boaz replied, I've been told all about you, what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your mother and father and your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Here Boaz sees Ruth gleaning in his fields, and he finds out the story about her good character and what she had done in coming back to this land with Naomi, even though she didn't have to. And he establishes that she's a good woman, and he acknowledges that in coming and in gleaning, she has come under the protective watch care of the God he serves. And so he's acknowledging God and how God has provided and how God is even using him in his obedience to the law to see those needs met. In essence, Ruth is telling this man, Boaz, put your money where your mouth is, man. <laughs> I know you serve God. I know you love God. And I know we're related. And I know there's social obligation. And I'm telling you, this is the opportunity you have to do what is right and best. And I want to give you that wonderful opportunity. This is boldness. Don't just acknowledge God. Work with God and his redemption. This is a word for us. A word for us in how we go about living life. Do we live out of the same sense of social obligation? This is a word that we need to keep on hearing over and over and over again because in our American culture, we're generally only obligated to ourselves, our four, and no more. We're very individualistic in how we live life, which kind of cuts us off from a sense of really feeling the need to help others around us. But the calling of the church revolutionizes that approach or contradicts it, if you will. Listen to what James says in his commission to the church. He says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But James tells the church point blank, listen, you're supposed to use whatever resource you have to help, to express love, to declare value by the actions that you take. And what happens in this beautiful opportunity, this exchange between Ruth and Boaz, is Ruth discovers that Boaz is more than willing to redeem more than willing. This is not one of those, well, okay, passive response. This is more than, listen to what Boaz says in verse 10. He says, the Lord bless you, my daughter. There's that word again, my daughter. This kind of great, this, this kindness is greater than that which you have showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I'm a guardian redeemer of our family, there's another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night. And in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until the morning. Boaz just responds so beautifully to this. Hey, listen, you're giving me a gift here. You're giving me the privilege of doing what I really want to do. I long to do that. 
And uh, this, is, this kindness is greater than what you've already shown. You've shown a devotion to Naomi and coming back. Or this is even greater. You're wanting to yoke yourself to me? Even though you could have others? And there are other options and opportunities? Hey, listen, you know what? I'm going to work it out to make it happen. I love that. I'm going to work it out to make it happen. Which Boaz in the story of salvation represents Christ himself. Who in his kindness draws near and is just simply waiting for the open door to step in and do what he always longs to do. Too often times I think we misunderstand, you know, uh, we talked about it a couple weeks ago. God is not like Mighty Mouse who just kind of flies in and says, here I am to save the day. God is near. And he waits for the opportunity that we have to open our hearts up and allow him to step in and do what only he can do. And Boaz commits to the process, which is a beautiful way of showing us that ultimately we read into the story of Christ who committed and submitted himself to the process of God to lay his life down for humanity, to declare their value, and to redeem them. This becomes part of the story, this great salvation story. In verse 14 and 15, it says, So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could uh, be recognized. And he said, No one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, Bring me this shawl you're wearing and hold it out. And when she did so, he poured it into six measures of barley and placed the bundle on her. Then he went back to town. What Boaz does in this beautiful moment is not only is he saying, I'm more than willing to do this, but you know what? I'm not going to take advantage of the situation here. In fact, I'm going to cover this situation. I'm going to cover this misguided strategy by sending you here. I I love that you came. I love that it happened. But you know what? I'm going to protect your reputation here. So I'm going to tell all my men, don't you dare say a word about this. And I'm going to send you away full because I have made a promise. And this provision is both a sign, a tangible sign, that they could expect him to redeem. And we'll wait until the next week to finish out that part of the story. But then there's a fourth thing that we need to understand here, and that is that there is within this an opportunity for us to learn what it means to trust in God. Because in verse 16 and 18, it says that Ruth came to her mother-in-law, and Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? And then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. Naomi's interested in how things played out, for sure. Her misguided approach did not hinder God from working out something beautiful through this season. Once again, we see another part of the story that God is active even in the messiness of human condition. Even through it, in spite of it, even using it for his highest good. Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. This is once again a show of ministry to Naomi who had already testified of her distress. Listen to what she says again. Words we need to keep on making sure that we don't miss sight of. In verse 20 and 21 of chapter 1, don't call me Naomi, she said. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Her bitterness now in the story is being replaced by blessedness. Her emptiness is being replaced by fullness. Her blame of God for her circumstances being replaced by a confident trust in God's provision. Wait, she says. This is going to happen. I can feel it. I sense it. I know it. He's good. Naomi now is giving some good advice. Wait. Trust this. The story of Ruth teaches us value. Who does God consider valuable? Last week, Dustin talked about the quartet of the vulnerable, something that we need to continue to remind ourselves. These four groups of people that the scriptures throughout the Old Testament especially and into the ministry of Jesus in the early church testify. The widow, the orphan, the foreigner, the poor. These four are a quartet because they sing a song of helplessness and cries for help. 
and challenges within their marginalization. And the mission of the church, now listen to me, friends, is not to add value to the worthless. It's to restore value to the priceless. That's Pete Hughes from his book, All Things New. The idea that we don't add any value to people, we don't need to. Everybody's created in the image of God. And God so loved the whole world that he gave his only son. Value has already been declared to all humanity through creation and redemption. In the culture that treated people as objects or obstacles, Naomi and Boaz welcome Ruth into the family of God. And Ruth bears witness that the outside has something to bring to the table regarding who God is because we're all created in the image of God. Ruth calls Boaz to be who he said his God was. And she still speaks to us today, calling us out and up to the calling we have received to be the hands and feet of Christ for our world. We're invited to see not only in Boaz a picture of Christ who does what only he can do, but a picture of what God wills for us as followers of Christ. To be the one who welcomes, to be the one who works with God in redemption. Question before us today is, will we join Boaz in taking that responsibility seriously? Will we not be passive, but will we show the more than willing attitude? Would you pray with me? Holy God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this beautiful story a story of redemption that speaks to us today. We're grateful for the testimony of Ruth and the courage that she shows and the discernment and wisdom that is in her and yet in her powerlessness and need to express a request. We're thankful for your mercy towards Naomi who in her own powerlessness, dealing with bitterness, struggles in what to do, and yet you intervene. And we're so grateful for Boaz, who is a type of Christ that shows us what you have done in Jesus and becomes a model for us in how to live. We ask that you would speak to us. Show us who we are to declare value over and for. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen.